I receive. If I need it, they'll give it to me. And so it's not hard for me to picture a God who sits high and looks low, who dwells among us, who supplies all my needs. And so we ask that you will join us in singing, He Will Supply. He said he will. 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 He said he will.
ask and you'll receive by faith you will receive he said he will he said he will he said he will supply i know he will i know he will i know he will supply yes he will yes he will oh yes he will oh yes he will oh yes he will my god i know he will my god i know he will my god i know he will said he's able he's able yes my god is able he said he will supply another thanksgiving another Sunday after Thanksgiving. Sometimes in the fallenness of our human nature, I don't think we mean any harm, but we take for granted all of the gracious mercies that God extends to us and has been extending all of our lives. And every now and then, it's just good to pause. And for the believer in Christ, Thanksgiving is not just for the day of Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is every day. It's 365 days in the year. I'm sure that all of us have a spirit of sadness in terms of the past and present events that have transpired in our city and not only here but have erupted all across the country. Some good, some not good. But I would like for us all to pause now for a moment of silent prayer for our city first, for the officials, the leaders of our city, that they will listen to God and that they will have wisdom and understanding because the enemy is going to do all that he can to destroy. But we know this, and I made mention of this in the study, God can even use evil for his purpose to accomplish his goals, and biblical history documents that. So with our eyes closed, whatever, however you whatever you want to say, just breathe that to the Lord. I'm sure that you have been praying over this before, but with each of us now together, unified in terms of our spirit, let us just pray for God's peace and for his will to be done. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we ask it. May we all say together, Amen. <clears throat> Last Sunday, we began our study <clears throat> in Psalm 103. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, we looked at the first five verses of this 103rd Psalm. And uh, this morning we want to continue our study in that same passage and we want to look at verses 6 to 10 this morning, Psalm 103, the 103rd Psalm, verses 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. 
If you have it, say amen. amen. If you don't have it, even say amen. May we all stand as we share together the reading and the voicing of God's holy word. The 103rd Psalm, beginning at verse 6, let us read together. The Lord works righteousness, executes righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. He made known his ways unto Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He have not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. Amen. We'll stop right there and continue with the okay of God next Sunday. These verses, David Most historians say that he is the writer of the psalm, and by tradition, we take it that David is the speaker here. Last Sunday, as we looked at the first five verses, David started out by saying, Bless the Lord, O my soul. And you know, and I thought about it, and I said to myself, this psalm fits in beautifully this season of the year right now. David says, bless the Lord, O my soul. It looks like, as we looked at those first five verses, that David was trying to open up his soul and his soul seemed to have been sluggish and lethargic. And he was shaking his soul and he was saying, Soul, you know God has done some marvelous things for you. Bless him. Praise him. Glorify him. For he is worthy. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Every fiber Every molecule of my being is to praise him because what he has done and the choir, bless their hearts, and I thank God to see them again. And that song, that song pointed to the graciousness and the mercy of God. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and what? Everything that is within me, bless what? His holy righteous name. Then David goes on to say now, don't forget what he's done for you. And he enumerates five things. He starts out by saying that, first of all, he uh, forgives all of my sins, heals my diseases, redeems my life from death the pit, crowns me with love and compassion, satisfies my desires with good things so that my youth is renewed like the eagles. God, and, and, and I'm sure that each of us here in this room this morning, we can identify with David because if we are sincerely honest and let our minds reflect and go back in our own personal lives, we can remember things that God has done in terms of his redemptive love for us. Amen. And that all of us are aware of the fact that we're not here this morning because of our goodness, because we have been perfect in our lives, in our thinking, in our action, in our intercourse with other people, even with our families. We have messed up somewhere along the way, but God in his mercy has given us another chance. 
And then that led David into the verses 6 to 10, where David shows us how God treats sinners. And indeed, all of us identify with that this morning because in, in the book of Romans, we are told in Romans 3.23, Paul tells us that what? All have sinned. Not some, not, not just the low class, the middle class, but what? Everybody has sinned. And the reason why Paul says that is because everybody was born a sinner. We were born with a depraved nature. We were not born, reborn again from the wound of our mother. Amen? We were saved, not at birth, physical birth, but we were saved with the second birth. So David says, now let me show you how God deals with sinners, how he treats us. And he begins with the fact that the Lord, first of all, he executes. The word executes literally means he works his righteousness, his, uh, his justice, that which is best for our lives. What David here is saying is that God manifests his faithfulness to his own covenant. Said another way, God keeps his word to himself. Turn to the 15th chapter of Genesis and look at verse 12. I'm not going to read that, but I think as a background to lay a uh, stronger foundation for what David is saying here. There in that passage, God is talking to Abraham, and he has promised Abraham that I'm going to make you the father of many nations. I'm going to give you this land, and your descendants are going to be like the stars in the sky. You can't count them. You won't be able to count your descendants. be like the grains of sand on the seashore. And so after God makes this pledge to Abraham, then there was an old ancient covenant or uh, 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 pledge that both parties entered into. And they would take animals and they would kill them and they would cut them in half and lay the halves on opposite sides of one another. And then each party would walk through the halves of the animals pledging symbolically that if I don't keep my word, if I'm lying, then I will be dead just like these animals that have been slaughtered. And then the next party will walk through it. Well, Abraham is thinking that he's going to do the same thing. But after God tells Abraham to kill the animals, cut them in half, lay the halves opposite one another, what he, God does a strange thing. He puts Abraham to sleep. And while Abraham is snoring, <laughs> God walks between the halves of the animals himself. In other words, what God is saying, God is saying, I made the covenant. I keep my covenant. Abraham, I don't need you to try because you're too frail, you're too weak, you will possibly break it at the slightest provocation or if there are any problems arise, but I never break my word. I can keep my word, I can't depend on you to keep your word. So God pledged himself for Abraham, and do you know God still does the same thing right now? He has pledged through Jesus Christ, what? To save us and to love us. Now, his covenant is with us. God always keeps what? His word. But now let me ask a question. Do we always keep our word? God manifests his faithfulness. Then David said, he executes justice. This is a symbol historically going back to Exodus, the 34th chapter. And let's turn to that just very briefly, verses 6 and 7 in Exodus chapter 34, where God is telling Moses, 
as he is giving him his word to Moses. Beginning at verse 5, reading from the NIV, it says, Then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him, talking about Moses, and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. I'll stop right there. David, when he made this statement right here, he was thinking about what God had done for his people down in Egypt and how God had delivered them and had he had truly devoted himself to them. For if it had not been for God, then they would have perished. God is a good God, is he not? And he goes on to say, Yahweh is merciful and gracious, slow to anger. His wrath is not easily provoked. He's abounding, plentifully, overflowing in mercy, his covenant love. David concludes here, he will not always strive. The word strive here, he means to contend or to struggle or to argue like in a courtroom. He will not always contend with us, nor will he keep, hold, maintain his anger forever. There is a limit to God's wrath. God's wrath is temporal. And aren't you glad that God doesn't stay mad with you like man does? People holding grudges 10, 20, 30, and 40 years. You remember the, uh, the historical incident of the Hatfields and the McCoys? and how they fought and killed one another. And after four or five or six generations, it reached the point where the young people didn't even know what the feud was all about. But they were still mad and hating one another, killing one another. Ain't you glad you ain't like man? I mean, that God, forgive me, is not like man. Because if he was like man, do you know that this would be an empty room this morning? Can I repeat that again? If God was like us, this room would not be occupied with our presence. Amen? There is a limit to his wrath. But, but, always remember that conjunctive word. Look here. He has not dealt with us. And I'm going to stay here for a little while because this area is crucial. God has not dealt with us according to our sins, which means our actions, what we have done. For we have missed the mark of God's holiness, like an archer shooting an arrow. Nor has he punished us according to our iniquities, our crookedness. We've deviated from the path of his mercy. If God gave us what we truly deserve, we would all perish. I didn't hear but about one or two or three or four amens. Uh, maybe some of y'all feel as though you deserve to be here. You deserve what God has done. Let me repeat it again. If God gave you and me what we deserve, let me, let, let, let me put it in a different setting. How many of you, well, I, I admit that this is a very delicate subject now that has come up in the pro football era uh, about uh, um, corporal punishment to children. But some of us here this morning came up in a different era. Amen? And corporal punishment was not considered to be a crime then. Amen? 
Now, I know my mother, and I told her this about three days before the Lord called her home, and we were just trying to get her to laugh and to smile. I said, Mama, if you lived in this day and time and the way that you whipped me and the Haviland, I said, we could easily call the police and have you put in jail and you would never see daylight anymore. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. And you start sitting there sophisticated, act like it didn't happen to you. You know it did. Now, it wasn't because our loved ones, our parents didn't love us. Amen? They were trying to what? Correct us. But then there were other instances where we deserved corporal punishment. But they didn't do it, did they? Why? They loved us. And, they, and, and, and in essence, it, they were saying, because of mercy, I'm giving you mercy now. I'm not going to give you what you deserve. But I'm going to give you my love. Now, it, 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 there was fear on the inside because you knew. You knew that that whip, that, 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 that switch, that belt, whatever it was, you knew that you deserved for that to come down across you, right? And you were bracing your spirit for it. But when they said, I'm not going to whip you this time, I'm going to give you another chance. Well, God is greater than our parents. And there have been many, many, many times in your life and my life that we deserved for him to whip us, to punish us. But he didn't do it. I don't know whether you're thankful this morning, but I am. Let me give you another example. You remember when God sent the deaf angel down through Egypt and said that the firstborn of man and beast was going to die? And you remember when he, the deaf angel went through Goshen, which was where the Israelites were living, Nobody died, but everybody died on the side of Egypt. Why? Because, say what? Why was it that nobody died out of the, Israel, of the Israelites? Nobody, no children died in their family. Why was it? Blood. And the blood came from where? Animal. And what was animal uh, symbolizing? Sacrifice. The Passover lamb. The Passover lamb became a substitute for their sins. Let me say it another way. If it had not been for the Passover lamb, their firstborns would have died like the Egyptians' firstborn died. Amen. But because of the what? The substitute, the lamb of God, the substitute became what? a symbol of mercy that God loved them. Now, as I conclude our message this morning, I want to ask a question of all of us. By what right do we stand before God now? So you're going to plead blood. What about my blood? What, 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 what my blood do? If you take my life, isn't in, in, in that enough? Because in light of the events that are happening now, there are a whole lot of lives that are innocent that have been taken, been snuffed out. Uh, well, 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 well what's, what's wrong with uh, one of the deacons' lives? If they died, what's wrong with their blood? Can their blood atone? Can a righteous person's blood atone? No. What about a holy person? Can their blood atone? Why not? Because, right, all is sin. There is no such thing as a perfect man here on this earth. So now what has God done for us that we could not do for ourselves? In John chapter 1 verse 29, he says what? God has sent his son, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, 
what? To take away the sins of the world. And if it was not, what? For Jesus. He has not dealt with us according to what we deserve, according to our sins. Now, if you think you're so holy, give me a moment to delineate some things. Just because you haven't committed a gross public sin, like a murder, robbery, uh, pedophilia, those kind of crimes, you're not a serial killer, you're a decent person, you try to take care of your family, uh, you go to work, you work hard, you provide for them, you pay your bills, uh, you give to charities, uh, you've even visited some sick in the hospital, uh, you're not as bad as some of these other folk that you see on TV. So therefore, God should give you a pass. But God says there is no pass for anyone except through Jesus Christ. There is none good in Isaiah. We're not good. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So, what we couldn't do, God in Jesus Christ has dealt with my sin and your sin, and he has not given me what I deserve, and I can't, I can't vouch for you, but I am so glad that God did not do what he should have done when my mind reflects back over the years and some things I thought, said, and did, if God had immediately acted in anger, I wouldn't be here at this moment. But because he's merciful, he's kind, he's gracious, he keeps his word to his covenant, not my covenant, because I break it all the time. I've broken it in the past, and... Uh, if the Lord allows me to live a couple of more years, I'll possibly break it again. Maybe not knowingly, but unknowingly, I'll break it again. But God, I can depend on, for he is a good God, and he's worthy to be praised. Therefore, David said, his mercy is victorious. His mercy triumphs over his wrath and over our sins. In Romans 5.20, Paul says, where sin abounded, grace abound much more. Let's, let, 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 let me say it my way. You can't out sin God's grace. You didn't get that. Beautiful Sunday morning, you're still sluggish in your spirit. Shame on you. You cannot do more sin than his grace cannot cover. Does that make sense? Well, say amen. amen. You cannot out sin grace. Where sin abound, grace abound much more. His mercy is overflowing mercy. Lastly, his righteousness is not relegated or controlled by our sins, but his righteousness is governed by the purpose of his mercy. God has a plan for each life on planet Earth. We don't know what that plan is. He does not open it up. He does not let us see months and years down the line. It's just what? One day at a time. And sometimes it's not even one day. Sometimes it's just what? One hour at a time. Sometimes it breaks down to what? One minute at a time. Sometimes it breaks down to the minutia one second at a time. That's the reason why the writer says we walk by what? And not by what we see. Because if you go by what you see, you know what's going to happen? The enemy is going to put fear in your heart. He's going to choke your faith. 
He's going to tell you it's not worth it. He's going to tell you that God doesn't love you. He's going to tell you that God ain't with you. That if God loved you, that if he wanted the best for you, he would allow that to happen in your life. And according to hum to our, our what, shredded, uh, benighted human logic, we would say to ourselves, this makes sense. If he loved me, he wouldn't allow this to happen to me. But then, if you go to the book of Job, Job counteracts that, does he not? For Job, we are told, was a righteous man. And every day he offered up sacrifices to God. But in spite of his righteousness, Job uh, encountered what? Adversity. He encountered trouble. Everything in his life. He lost everything. And there was a moment where Job held on temporarily. But then, if you keep reading the book of Job, you'll see where Job almost lost it. For Job became angry. In fact, when his friends came, if they had remained silent past the week, the seven days, maybe it would have helped Job. But after they opened their mouths and started opposing questions, then it brought doubt into his heart. For their consensus was this. Job, you had to have done something wrong. Even if you don't know what it was, even if you can't remember, you had to have sinned somewhere because God don't punish folk unless they have sinned. And there was a consensus then. But see, on this side, we know better. For we realize that when trouble and when problems and when darkness come in every life, it's not necessarily because you've done something wrong. It could be because God is testing your faith to see whether you hold on to his unchanging hand. And it's easy to let go. But let me tell you, if you have not gone through some dark tunnels in your life, Hang around a little bit longer. Stay here a little bit longer. Imbibe the oxygen a little bit longer. And believe me, you're going to go through some dark tunnels. And when you do, calling on other folk ain't going to help you that much. They can give you psychological insight. They can give you encouragement. But in the end, you're going to have to go to the Lord God Almighty. You're going to have to examine your faith and find out where you stand. And then in the end, you're going to have to lean on his word and realize God is faithful to what he said. And he will keep you until the day of redemption. I can depend on him. I can trust him, for he's a trustworthy God. And you know, from the human brokenness in all of us, whenever things arrive in our lives, there is an unconscious, I think, human tendency to want to analyze it from our perspective, but not just to put ourselves and whatever we're going through in the hands of God. I shared this with you. I think it was last month. I don't know when it was. But after I had gone through several procedures for kidney stones in both kidneys, I thought to myself, well, after the uh, urologist gets through I'll have all of these stones out of me, and then I can get back to my life as normal. And I'll be John Brown before I could sneeze. I slipped up and then broke my kneecap. And then I started thinking, now Lord, what else is going to happen? You know, have, 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 I been, have I been so unfaithful? that you're permitting this to come in my life? What have I done? All I want you to do is just tell me. And then I'll repent of it. And heaven gets silent like brass. 
And then later on the Lord said, These things come to all flesh. And it's not a matter of you or them, but it's a matter in terms of whether you still trust me through all of this, whether I'm still your God. And then one day I was watching TV, and they were showing one of, these, one of these vets that had come back from the war. Both of his legs had been blown off, and he was smiling, and he was talking. And the Holy Spirit said, look there, he ain't got no legs. At least you do have a leg. And if God is willing after a while, you can walk on it. He ain't got nothing to walk on. Now, why are you so sad? And somebody here this morning is going through a down moment in your life. But I want to reassure you, God ain't walked away from you. If anything, you have left him in your thoughts and in your heart. But that's okay. He ain't mad with you. He still loves you. Come on back to him. How do I know that? Because he sent a word worker. Preachers, you, 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 you know what I'm saying? A word, W-O-R-D dash worker, W-O-R-K-E-R. -E and that word worker is Jesus Christ. For Jesus said, I am what? I'm the word. I'm the word. And what did he do? He worked the word. He healed. He raised bodies from the grave. And then uh, he went on to give his body as a sacrifice on a cross, on a hill called Calvary. And when he died, he said to his father, I have completed everything you told me to do. I was the word you sent me. I told them who I was. Some believed, some did not believe. I worked signs and miracles. Some believed, some did not believe. But that's okay, Father. Into thine hand I commend my spirit. And he died. But that's not the end of the story. For there are many religions, their founders died, and they are still dead. But three days later, our founder, our architect, our bishop got up out of his grave with all power in his hands. And I give him to you this morning, on this Sunday morning after Thanksgiving, for he's somebody to be thankful for. He's somebody to be praised. He's somebody to worship this morning. He's somebody to give your life to this morning. He's somebody to turn everything loose. Like the songwriter said, I surrender all. All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I what? Freely give. I will ever love and serve him and trust him daily. I want to dwell in his presence. As the invitation is extended, if there's somebody here this morning, you don't know Jesus Christ. You don't know the Lamb of God that takes away everybody's sin if they will trust him by faith. The God who keeps faith to his own faith. The God who keeps faithful to his own word that he does not break. He does not lie. He does not go back on his word. He's not a traitor to his word, for he's true to his eternal word. And when he said, I have come that they might have life and have it what? More abundantly. Yes, David was right. When he said he hasn't dealt with us according to our sins. He has not handled us as our sins demand. He has not given us what we deserve. Instead of death, he's given us what? Life and life eternal. As we stand, if you're here this morning 
He's calling you.